Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna talk about the Ponte Vecchi. Oh. Thank you to my nephew Pierce for the assist on that. He's two years old and my sister sent me a couple videos saying, hey, he really wants to be in one of Uncle Pat's videos, can you include him? And so he's cute and so that's why he's in there. Today though, we're gonna talk about the Intel Ponte Vecchio GPU, which I called a spaceship because that's frankly what it is. Now Ponte Vecchio is like really the high-end GPU that's gonna go in supercomputers really starting next year in 2022. It's designed for absolutely crushing performance. It has a exascale supercomputer win in Aurora, but aside from it just being a GPU and from Intel, not AMD or Nvidia, it also has a really interesting feature. In fact, it has 47 active pieces of silicon on the single GPU. And that's exactly why I really called it a spaceship because that's kind of what it is. Up until today, there's been a couple different ways that people have really built GPUs. And really the three most common ways that you would go build a GPU is that you have a monolithic die. A lot of the consumer GPUs kind of look like that. The other option is that you had something like chip on wafer on silicon, which is something that we've seen a lot, especially in the NVIDIA kind of higher end data center GPUs. There, what you do is you have your GPU die, you have a couple of HBM dies or HBM2 dies, whatever, and then you have a silicon interposer on the bottom, and then you basically go and that, that helps your communication between those different dies. But it's relatively simple. And if you look at like really high-end GPUs over the last couple of years, they may have, you know, something like six to eight pieces of silicon that are all tied together like that. But it's a relatively simplistic type of, of, of interconnect, right? And then the third way is really what AMD Epic does. And that's not necessarily a GPU, but really kind of getting out and scaling out in terms of cores. They did something different where they basically go and they have a bunch of dies up to a total of nine dies right now on a PCB that is basically the package for the CPU. And so you basically have PCB and you have you know your wires from all the different dies and that's how you do the interconnect. That's kind of an easier way to go do it. And really AMD by doing that method, that was a lot easier. They were able to go and get multi-die earlier. But what Intel is doing with Ponte Vecchio is something completely different. Intel has a total of 47 pieces of active silicon on the package. Plus they have silicon from different fabs. They're not just coming from Intel fabs, they're also coming from TSMC and they're coming from different nodes at these different fabs. So they're integrating a ton of different process technology onto a single package. In fact, they basically have as many different types of silicon on their chip as we've seen like total number pieces of silicon other people assembled previously. So going from something like six to eight up to 47 is like a huge leap in terms of overall chip design, right? So let's be clear, these are really destined to be more like maybe quarter two of 2022-ish parts. But at the same time, I think that Intel's really done a lot of disclosure, both at Intel Architecture Day 2021, as well as Hot Chips 33 in the last like week or so. And so I really wanna just kind of do a little recap and just kind of explain what's going on here. So let's start with the cores. So the Intel XE core is the base unit for all the computation that's happening here. You basically have eight vector and eight matrix engines. You have a fairly large level one cache. It's like a half a megabyte of level one cache. And that whole structure is basically the Intel XE core. So basically what Intel does is they take 16 of these XE cores, they put them together, they add in 16 ray tracing cores because this is a GPU of course, and then they also have their hardware control unit and they call that a slice or the Intel XE slice. Now what's bigger than a slice? Apparently that's a stack because if you take four of those slices, put them together and then add a level two cache, the high bandwidth memory controllers, and then the XE link, that's basically how you get a stack. And what's better than having a stack, it's having a two stack where you basically take two of those, put those together, which means you get a total of 128 Intel XE HPC cores. You get a total of 128 ray tracing units, eight hardware control units, eight HBM2E memory controllers, two media engines, and you get 16 XE links. Now, XE links, if you don't know what those are, those are basically Intel's version of NVIDIA and V-Link. You can kind of think of, of it kind of that way, where you have a interconnect between the different GPUs so that they can communicate. Oh, and if you want to go put your GPUs together, you have a couple options for doing that. You can have your single GPU, you can have two GPUs, you can have four GPUs, six GPUs, or up to eight GPUs using the XE link. Now, just kind of giving you some sense of a couple of different scenarios here. I think, you know, we're not really focused on the single and double, but really the quad one, we just did an NVIDIA Redstone. So it's a Dell PowerEdge XE 8545 platform based on the four GPU NVIDIA Redstone platform. So that's one that we just did. And if you want to go see what NVIDIA is doing, 
doing with the A100 and that four GPU platform, that's really there. There's also the eight GPU platform. We looked at versions both from Inspur and Supermicro. And on the Supermicro side, we also looked at the liquid cooling and versus air cooling versions of those. And so you can kind of see what an HGX A100 eight GPU platform is if you want to go look at our reviews. We'll have all that stuff linked in the description. The six is actually kind of interesting because that is what the Aurora supercomputer for the Department of Energy that Intel is building with Sapphire Rapids and Ponte Vecchio. Those are going to be, I guess, you know, the six GPU configurations and they're going to be liquid cooled and all kinds of really cool stuff like that. But really coming up with a chip like this or just a single chip wouldn't really be that exciting, right? Like it's not really the XE core, frankly, that's the most exciting part about this. There are a lot of people that are doing different types of cores and different ways to kind of do vector and matrix multiplication. So, I mean, that, that's not really, to me, at least the thing that makes this a spaceship. What does make this a spaceship is how it's put together and packaged. And putting that together, the basic ones that Intel has disclosed this far, they have the compute tile, they have the Rambo cache tile. Yep, that's actually what the high-speed cache is called, Rambo cache, because I guess it just sounds cooler. There's also the base tile, HBM tile, XE tile. There's the EMIB tile. Then you have to go put all those tiles onto a big package. And then you're gonna see this thing called Fovros. We're gonna get into that in a second. So the actual compute and those XE cores and, and really that part of the Pontiac GPU, that's actually made on TSMC five nanometer. So it's not necessarily made on an Intel process, which is quite noteworthy actually. And if you remember how we went into the slices and stacks, that really, you kind of think about how small that is in terms of a compute die, right? That's actually a pretty small compute die. That's just the eight XE cores on that little tile. Now, Nvidia, on the other hand, still is making monolithic dies that may change hopefully in the near future. But the challenge with the monolithic die is that when you make a giant die, if you have a defect in your manufacturing process on that giant die, you're basically stuck with a die that you either have to bin as a lower bin part or you know you have to say mm, it's in a bad place so we can't use the die at all and that lowers your yield by having smaller dies Intel's doing something very similar to what AMD does on the Ryzen and Epic side where by having small dies you you may have those defects still but they're only going to really kind of hurt a small number of dies per wafer. And that means that your overall yield or the you know amount of area that you get on those round wafers that you can actually go and make useful chips from, that's actually a lot higher if you have smaller dies. So that's really kind of beneficial if you want to go build big chips. But the challenge, of course, is the fact that, well, even if you have a high yield on a small die, you don't necessarily get the performance of having a big die because you get more performance the bigger your die is. Anytime you have to go off of a piece of silicon, you tend to lose some performance and the interconnect power tends to be a little bit higher. So that's one of the big limiting factors and why everybody has done monolithic dies for a long time. And that's really one of the big innovations that AMD Epic really brought was the fact that they said, hey, we can do this in a mainstream server part. So basically those compute dies have to be married with the Rambo cache and then they are put onto a base die. That base die is using Intel 7, so it's not even TSMC. Also on that base tile, we get a total of 144 megabytes of level two cache, so we get a lot more cache on that tile. And really to put this all together, there's like two technologies that Intel is using or relying heavily upon. First is EMIB, which is really kind of die to die, kind of think of them like maybe adjacent die to die uh, next to each other EMIB. So you have very, very small bumps, which allows you, and those bumps you can kind of think of as like kind of like wire terminals. And then the idea is that you can have very high density uh, interconnects because you can have more wires, the smaller that they are. And if you have more wires and you're able to do it at a low enough power, that basically means that you can get enough bandwidth between the different chips to make multi-chip possible. Intel's been doing EMIB for years on their Agilex, so their FPGAs, but they're now bringing it into both this product as well as the upcoming Sapphire Rapids. Now, Foveros is a little bit different, but without going like way, way technical on this, the basic idea with Foveros is that you can stack dies on top of each other. And so instead of just having a single plane of dies, which may be connected via EMIB, you can also go up and you can actually have like kind of like a tower of dies or multiple dies stacked on top of each other. So that kind of allows you to do what's called 3D packaging. And that is a super new area really that we're gonna start seeing that in server chips probably in the next year or so. Another one that I think is really important is the fact that these also have, you know, the eight XE links that are coming out of them. And the importance really there is just the idea that having an interconnect that is very fast and having those 90, 90 G30s, uh, that's, pretty important because you have to get a lot of data going between the different GPUs as you kind of build out these high speed, high performance clusters of GPUs. NVIDIA is doing with NVLink. And if you didn't know this, when we kind of highlight it whenever we do the big HGX A100 systems, especially because those have the switches built in. But 
That actually in VLink architecture uses a ton of power. The advantage of course is that you get a coherent interface, a cache coherent interface, and you get a ton of bandwidth compared to PCIe and also lower latency. But at the same time, that takes a lot of power because you're moving a ton of bits really fast. Intel's already talking about over five terabytes per second of memory bandwidth and over two terabytes per second of interconnect bandwidth. And it's very hard not to say terabits and say terabytes there. But anyway, the way that these things are actually packaged is they're not packaged in a PCIe form factor because for high-end accelerators, PCIe is just toast. Like, right, nobody's using PCIe or thinks of PCIe as really kind of working with high-speed accelerators even today, really. I mean, most folks are not running out and saying like, hey, I want the high performance NVIDIA A100 and they're not buying the PCIe versions of that. Those are more for like using MIG and doing inferencing and stuff like that. If you really want high performance, you're in SXM4 so you can run 400 or 500 watts. But what happened was Facebook really kind of drove and the other hyperscaler said, yeah, this is a good idea. And they said, hey, we don't want to be stuck with these kind of NVIDIA SXM kind of proprietary sockets that just, or packages, that just doesn't make sense. We want to be able to use different accelerators from different vendors. And so that's how we got the OAM or the Open Accelerator Module, which is a project out of the Open Compute Project. And these things are absolutely massive and they're what Pontevecchio is going to use. And also expect that we're going to see some of the Habana Labs products come out for this too, because we've already seen them actually in OEM modules. But the idea is that this is gonna be the new open standard that allows all the interconnects between the host system and the accelerators like the GPUs and also the inter GPU or inter accelerator communication. So there's a whole bunch of different topologies. We have pieces on this on the STH main site. If you wanna go learn more about OEM, go for it. But that's what Pontevecchio is gonna use. And just to kind of give you an idea, here's what one of these things looks like, or at least one of the early you know, kind of cooling mock-ups and this kind of in my hand uh, at one of the open compute summits. And these things are just absolutely massive. Now we are talking about that is an, you know, heat sink today, but these things realistically, you know, next generation of accelerators, we're going to start seeing a 600 watt and higher. And as these things go from 600 watt and higher, what you're going to start seeing is that everybody needs to start using liquid cooling, or most people are going to start using liquid cooling. And that is exactly why we did the liquid versus air cooling video with the eight NVIDIA A100s just a couple weeks ago. And if you don't believe me, not only is the Exascale Aurora supercomputer going to be a liquid cooled solution with its six Pontevecchio GPUs, but also, you know, Intel is even just showing, hey, here's what our Sapphire Rapids and four Pontevecchio GPU solution is. And you'll notice that there are cold plates and pipes because that's liquid cooled. Also this week, Intel actually announced a partnership with Submer, which is one of the immersion cooling uh, companies. We've covered Submer before on STH, but just kind of give you an idea of what Intel is thinking for next gen, liquid cooling is definitely going to be it. So get ready. And probably something that should be its own video is the fact that Intel at least has the understanding. Now execution, I think they're still working on it, but you know, just in terms of understanding, they're saying like, hey, look, we got CPUs, we got FPGAs, we have GPUs, we're going to have these AI accelerators, we have all kinds of different, you know, different pieces of silicon, how are we going to make it easy enough for folks to use? Because NVIDIA, one of their benefits is they say, hey, come use CUDA, and you can use our entire GPU stack, but you don't really need anything other than CUDA, right? But for Intel's strategy of having multiple different types of silicon, they need to have software, and that's where one API comes in. That's something that they've been working on for years. I actually think that this is the totally right direction for Intel to go. So super excited about that. But in terms of do they have a CUDA answer? I think they do. And I actually think that they have a better strategy right now than AMD has, at least on the software side. And so the reason that I think the Intel Pontevecchi oh. Thanks again, Pierce. And so the reason that I think that the Intel Pontevecchio is a complete spaceship is just because of how much innovation had to go into this and what it means for the future of the chip industry. By having 47 pieces in a system or in a GPU that is going to ship into a large scale system, this is gonna move from all these you know, 2D, 3D technologies really being kind of like, hey, this is an idea that we had in a lab to being something that people can see and say like, okay, well, that is going to be the modern way that we have to start making chips to manage our yield and still get very big, large chips and also very high performance chips. So when I say it's a spaceship, it's because it really is breaking into a new frontier for the industry. And the people who would make a spaceship might be shipbuilders. And well, so the people who make a spaceship chip 
should be chip builders, right? And these folks had to innovate on a ton of different technologies, just in terms of, you know, how do you start integrating these things? How do you go build these things? How do you actually, you know, reliably make them? How do you test them? I mean, there's a whole bunch of different technologies, right? You have different thermal expansion. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that these guys have to go deal with if to go put something together like this. This is most definitely not an easy feat of engineering. So we still have some time till the Pan Vecchio GPU comes out. And you know, certainly AMD and NVIDIA know that this is coming out. They are going to have competitive responses. But at the end of the day, this is just super cool that we're entering this new era of chip design and really just the things that you're going to be able to go and buy. These types of innovations are the big step functions that really help human innovation hit the next level. And so that's why I am personally very excited for it. Although our power bills in the STH lab are definitely... I would say I'm a little bit nervous about what those are gonna be next year. Anyway, if you like this video, why don't you give us a like, click subscribe, turn on the notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.